Victory! Welcome to the Vogue Podcast. Welcome to the Vogue Podcast, wanker. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of the Vogue Podcast. We are joined with myself and Fuji, aka Hello. Flash. Hello. And Ronald. And uh, for this episode, we are with none other than John Patrick Lowry and Ellen McLean. And uh, they actually both were in, they are both in Team Fortress 2 and in many other Valve games. So how are you guys doing? Great, great. How are you? We're good. We're good. We're good. This is, uh, this is, this is Flash. He uh, wasn't here with uh, Ellen last time, but another member of ours. I, I'm new. Um, he's a new guy. <laughs> new guy. So how are you guys, how are you guys doing with, uh, with COVID and everything? Well, uh, at, we're out in Seattle, and uh, Washington State's doing fairly well. Uh, the you know we're waiting with everybody else for the vaccines, but mm-hmm. uh, um, fortunately, as voice actors, we can do our work and be socially distanced. So yeah, it hasn't really interrupted much of what we do. Although, um, of course, uh, Valve hasn't been doing didn't do the international this year, mm-hmm. um, and so that was you know that was something that impacted us but uh uh we well, uh, and just dis- and disappointing well, for well everybody. right 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 <laughs> um uh but uh you know the they did have a virtual international kind of event and uh and so we got to be involved with that um and uh, my uh audio drama company uh, oral vision llc imagination theater we have figured out a way to uh continue to produce those shows so so we're pretty busy with that. Um, other than that, we stay home a lot and we wear our masks when we go out and uh, stuff like that. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she, uh, on Zoom. Ellen teaches voice on, on Zoom. So, right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. I yep. found it surprisingly effective. Um, it's made my uh, students more uh, uh, independent. Uh, they, they, their, their keyboard skills are improving, and I think their understanding of music is improving because they have to do everything themselves. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm on the Zoom link. I'm in my little square, yeah. you know, suggesting <laughs> things, but but they have to make it all happen. So because usually yeah. when people come here for a voice lesson with me. I do all the playing, but hmm. you know, with the time lag, uh, you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone's more open to do their own thing now. I mean, it's, of course, be more independent. I actually didn't know that Valve did the international virtually. I wasn't aware. Well, of that, it, it wasn't, it wasn't really the international virtually. They released a thing that was kind of international like. Oh, that yeah. I did the announcement packet for and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? Oh, you, you're talking about the compendium, right? Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They they, <laughs> they they tried to maintain all the rewards, and you you did the international announcer voice pack as well. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. To kind of give people some kind of experience yeah, a, that's kind of like the international. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's good to see that you guys are doing. I mean, I, I, you know, I think about that a lot, how everyone's doing and, uh, you know, really glad that you guys are keeping, keeping safe as well as still doing your work, which is important. Well, yeah. and we're also fortunate that we have each other. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're here in our little cocoon <laughs> together and yeah. um, we we actually have a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. We motivate yeah. each other to put our pants on and, you know, stuff like that. So. <laughs> I've got, I've got That's my right. pants. I have yeah. pants on too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. No, that, you, you can trust me that I yeah, also yeah. have pants. <laughs> but I mean, that doesn't necessarily. But um, I hope I'm, I'm sure Ronald does because he doesn't really have a camera. We kind of just imagine what he looks uh, I'm, like. I'm not existent. I'm not here. Mm. No. He's... <laughs> yes, you are, Ronald. Yes, you are. All I'm right, going so... to hope he's wearing pants right now. So yeah, yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> and if he isn't let's hope that he has a pants assistant like right, right. <laughs> no comment <laughs> pants assistant there we go good man <laughs> all right since yeah. we had the topic ellen and john how did you guys met if uh, that's something you can talk about sure um 
So uh, way back in 1984, um, I was uh, going to school, graduate school, get my master's degree in music composition. And um, they, uh, I was the only guitarist at Indiana University. And so when they decided to do the Broadway show Showboat as their summer opera, they asked me to play the guitar and banjo part in the orchestra. And I said, that was fine. And um, while we were rehearsing one day, a man named uh, uh, Bill, Bar Barkheimer. Bill Barkheimer, who was an alum of Indiana University, uh, came by and he was the conductor on a European tour of Showboat. And he was looking for somebody who could triple on violin and banjo and guitar. Well, when, when Indiana University asked me to play the guitar and banjo part for, for the show that summer, they asked me if I played the banjo and I had never played the banjo, but I said yes and went out and bought a banjo and learned how to play it. So, so that was the kind of lying I did to get into that gig. But even I wasn't audacious enough to tell somebody that I could play the violin when I couldn't play the violin. Um, guitar skills translate over to banjo pretty easily. Um, but so I said, no, I don't, I can't triple on the violin. And, but I told them, you know, if, if you want to hire me anyway, just make sure to get in touch with me before a certain date, because after that, I have to pay for my fall classes. And then I'm going on a mountain climbing trip in Colorado and you won't be able to get a hold of me. And he said, fine. Well, I didn't hear from him by that date. And so I went off to climb mountains. And when we came back down out of the San Juans, and of course this is before cell phones and all that kind of stuff. Um, we came back down into a little town called Gunnison, Colorado and uh, called back some friends of ours in Indiana. And they said, hey, listen, this Bill Barkheimer guy has been trying to get a hold of you. He's called all over Colorado. He wants you in Amsterdam by such and such a date. And so I called him. I said, how are we going to do this? I said, OK, why don't you go ahead and send my contract to general delivery in El Paso, because that's where we're going next to visit my grandparents. And then we will drive straight to Chicago from El Paso so that I can apply for a passport at, in, you know, at a, 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 not an embassy, but what's the, the next thing down? A, consulate. Yeah, a consulate. And so, so that it, it you know, expedites my passport so that I can get the passport by the date that I need to fly to Amsterdam. And so we drove to El Paso, picked up the contract at the post office, then drove straight to Chicago, applied for my passport. And like, you know, 12 days later, they had me on a plane to Amsterdam where on the first day of rehearsal, Bill took me over to the, to the rehearsal hall and he took me into the little canteen at the theater because he said, I want you to meet someone. And it's a person who is playing Magnolia and she has to accompany herself on guitar in this one song. And she has been just a monster. She has bought a guitar and she has been practicing, practicing, practicing. And, but she was, was, was wondering if you could give her guitar lessons. And so he brought me into the canteen and introduced me. He said, this is Ella McLean. And she turned to me and she said, have they told me, have they told you how pitiful I am? That was her first words to me. Um, I, can, I can recreate that. Okay. Please go ahead. Have they told you how pitiful I am? <laughs> with these, with these little puppy dog eyes, you know, and, stuff. and and so, and so, wow. so we started to talk, and yeah. and she was very gregarious and outgoing, and she said, "Well, um, everybody's over here, and first I memorized the first names of the principals." Yes, no, in you the have cast. to do it right. Okay. I've memorized the first names of the principals. And now I'm going to re uh, memorize the last names of the principals while I re memorize the first names of the chorus. And then I'll memorize the last names of the chorus. And then I'll memorize the first names of the orchestra. And then I'll memorize the last names of the orchestra. And then of course the crew, you learn everybody's name because you're working with the crew. And so with all this stuff, I thought, this, this person is patently insane. So this is going to be really interesting. Um, I'm not insane. I'm organized. That's right. <laughs> that's a word for it. Yeah. So anyway, that, so, so we met in Arnhem, Holland, which is the site of the movie A Bridge Too Far, a, a big battle in World War II. Um, 
and uh, I gave her one guitar lesson. That's right. I never learned how to play the guitar. Well, for one thing, I told it, I t and I told Bill Barkheimer, it's like, this is ridiculous asking an actor. To, this, is, this is not just a simple little tune. This is a Jerome Kern jazz tune in E flat with all kinds of weird chords in it and stuff like that. I mean, she would need to practice for you know, two years before she would be ready to play this tune. Exactly. And, exactly. and so they said, okay, well, you, so I, I ended up, you know, playing for her and she just finger synced on stage, which she did incredibly well because she'd been practicing the song for so long. But this was all back before anybody used microphones in Broadway show performances. It was all acoustic. And sometimes we'd be playing at, at, Air Force Army bases and stuff like that, where they just set up a little place for the orchestra and people would be like two feet away from me watching me play the guitar while she was up there pretending to play the guitar on stage. And then one time up in Oslo, Norway, uh, the orchestra was completely off to the side. And so people were right in front of her seeing this guitar with no sound coming out of it and the sound of my guitar coming out like 80 feet away. So she started acknowledging me uh, in, uh, during, in the, during, during the my curtain bow, call. Right. During my curtain call, I would come out bow, and then I would gesture to John, who was very frequently visible to the audience with his guitar. And I waved to folks and stuff like that. So, but that's how we met, and uh, we had our first date in Amsterdam. Which At I'd... an Italian restaurant right. in Amsterdam, and John. <laughs> told me about World War One. So if you Not want me. to seduce a woman, <laughs> talk to her about World War One. That's it. <laughs> what was your initial thoughts? I mean, like, you know, like Elon Musk, when he goes on his dates, he talks about electric cars. Like what what did like what was what was your initial like reaction to being told about World War One? Well, uh, John is a wonderful storyteller. And of course, you know, I knew World War I, I knew the event, but I didn't really know about the, the beginnings of it and why it happened. And of I mean, course- Nobody in America does, everybody- You know, the, the Crown Prince <laughs> oh, yeah, being assassinated in Serbia yeah. and, you know, all the things leading up to World War I. And, you know, because of Napoleon's, you know, uh, nationalism, you know, that sort of infected the rest of Europe with nationalism and, you know, all these monarchies and uh, no, uh, so many people having uh, no uh, reins on their power. They were absolutists, you know, they were absolutely in power. And so John telling me about all this also being very handsome, also having the most beautiful male voice I had ever heard. Who are we talking con about now? Contributed to talking about you, sir. the interest of this story. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was a pretty fatal combination. It was a story of a sordid tale of lust and depravity. I mean, no, that's, that's all I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to seduce a woman, you need to be smart. You need to have a nice voice. Yeah. Well, I, oh. yes. And it helps. Now it helps. Food in Amsterdam. And, and yeah, in Amsterdam, oh in an Italian restaurant. Cool. <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. So yeah, so that was our first date, and that's how we met. Um, and then and then we toured Europe for the next three and a half months, and it was very romantic, staying in you know six hundred year old hotels and uh, being tourists all day, and then playing the show at night. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yep. I do vaguely remember something about I, I I think it was our last interview, Ellen, when we when we talked about like I think you mentioned like you met John at an Italian restaurant, and that's that's how it that's kind of like the first time you guys you know went out and went on on a date or something but i do vaguely remember that but well um, actually you know i i went looking for him i knew the hotel we we many times were at different hotels near the theater and so oh, sorry to, to explain that, that at many times the cast and orchestra wouldn't be able to all stay at the same hotel 
Right. So some people were at one hotel and some so people So I knew he was at a different right. hotel. And so I went looking for him and nobody was at the desk, the reception desk. So I couldn't find him and he just happened to walk out and I said, you're exactly the person I'm looking for. Let's go to dinner. <laughs> so it wasn't really a date, you know, it was just So too... I invited him. Right, right. <sighs> she well, obviously, you know, needed someone to explain the, uh, the origins of World War I to her and she was looking for that person, so. Damn, sniper. <laughs> You were basically you were basically just informed that you're going on a date together and you had That's no right. say in the matter. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, People don't say no to me. Right. Right. No wonder. But I was, you know, I needed to eat and I obviously needed to explain to somebody how World War One started. So uh, yeah. it all worked yeah. out. You didn't mind the company either. That's right. That's right. You can't keep it to yourself. <laughs> It seems like the chemistry there was pretty instant. Well, we, uh, yes. yeah, yeah. I mean, because we, well, funny, I mean, everyone in the cast was either way younger than we were. We were in our early 30s. And, you know, most people in the chorus were in their early 20s. And the other people in the cast were, you know, anywhere from 40 all the way up to 65. So and and Ellen and I were born just six months apart. And so we, you know, we knew all of our Beatles references and, you know, all other cultural references and stuff like that. So we just kind of became pals. Well, and, and also, uh, you know, we had an interest in music because, um, you know, even though I was acting and singing, you know, in this show, uh, my degrees were in music. And so I had an interest in music. And then also, uh, John, is a wonderful director. Now, he is, at that point, it was kind of, you know, he hadn't realized that he was so good at this, but his watching the show every night and, and analyzing the story that was being told, we started talking about that and he gave me wonderful directorial ideas. You know, nothing that changed the staging, but just, you know, my take on a certain line or, or on a certain reaction. And um, he was so, uh, um, uh, what's the word I want? O observant and insightful. insightful. Thank uh -huh. you, thank you. So I'm handsome. I have a great voice. I'm insightful, and I know about World War One. But yeah, it was it was really fun because we had this, you know, we we were kind of palling around Europe, and we became these colleagues who were talking about music and theater and talking about. And the that's shows the thing. Like we're that. still colleagues. Right. Right. Yeah. Now John John has uh, continued to be my primary acting coach through the years and he's he's gotten me through some very difficult productions where uh the director of the production perhaps didn't have the depth of understanding that he does so john and i would work on things and then i would go to my rehearsal where the director would be very happy with my work not realizing that my husband was coaching me. Well, but I mean, lots of actors get acting coaches and you know, it's nice when you're married to them because then you don't have to pay them. So that's, that's yeah. nice. But anyway, that has to be the longest answer in the world to a very short question, how did we meet? Well, I mean, that's it's it doesn't come by simple, right? I mean, it's yeah, it's, it's a long story of, of how people meet. So right, I mean, it's right. completely yeah. good. World yeah. War One was long, long enough. <laughs> It was it was pretty Thank long war. It was pretty long. All it was right. a long war, fortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Think. Well, that's the thing. I don't I don't know I don't know much about World War One. But I, I guess it I, no one no one in America knows about World War One. We're just taught that it was caused by nationalism and America came in and saved the day. Oh yeah, as always. That's how all war, wars work. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it work, right? <laughs> we just come yeah. in, we come in and we just do it and we leave. That's the end of the story. Huh? That's right. That's right. It's the, it's the old Western, Western story of the handsome stranger riding in on the horse, solving the problem and then riding off into the sunset. Yeah. And the day is saved. Like 
we're in the age of humility let's have some humility for once huh yeah yeah. Uh, yeah i think it's important to get all the context and all the setup out for stories uh pertaining to how we live and uh, how we uh, fell in love and how it came to be because there's really important <laughs> like very small nuances and very important things like how did it happen uh, uh why did it happen mm-hmm. and so on and i guess with you guys it happened because yeah uh, he was very insightful very attentive uh and that <laughs> just grabbed you and then you decided you know what we're we're going on a date now. This is now a fact. You cannot uh, you cannot disagree with this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just... Of course, neither one of us really knew that it was a date, but it was because we were we were getting ready to to talk about the guitar and whether or not she should continue lessons or whether or not I should take over, um, and and all kinds of other things. I mean, we were, and, and of course, being on a European tour, you're in this little seventy person village that moves around. And you get and, and it's a tiny town where everybody knows everybody else's business, but you're in you know great big towns like you know uh, Hamburg or or Munich or mm-hmm. Paris or wherever. Um, and so we were just this little insular community that just moves around, and uh, it's very you know you're spending lots of time on the bus every day or <laughs> not every day, but you know going from town to town. And so you know it was just very conducive to getting to know people. And we made lots of great friends on that tour, and some of some of whom we're still in contact to this day. So, yes, mm. that's awesome. nice. All right, next question. So, what was the first project you guys ever worked on? Either acting or voice acting, it doesn't really matter. Oh, well, it was the theater, right? It was it was the theater that you guys. I think so, together. yeah. But like, maybe aside from that, like, what did you? What what, what was that kind of like the first project that you guys worked on? Maybe outside of theater. Uh, maybe like either voice acting or otherwise. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, hmm. well, let's see. Well, for a long time, theater was pretty much all we, I mean, so how, how we got into voice acting was kind of a project we worked on together. When I went back after the tour to work on my doctorate, we both got jobs as uh, DJs on uh, the local NPR station. WFIU um, in Bloomington, Indiana. Right, right. And, uh, <laughs> So we would, you know, spin classical records, actual vinyl records, and announce them and back announce them and stuff like that. And uh, we started doing, they, they asked us, since we were actors as well as musicians, they started asking us to do their commercials for them. And uh, they had a very funny person writing these scripts for various things. And we acted in those commercials. And that was the first professional voice acting we did was uh for this little radio station in bloomington indiana um creating these commercials wasn't it john paul who wrote them i think so yeah but uh, very interesting you know two first names john paul right but But, he wrote these very funny commercials where uh you know two people would be conversing and uh you know the the characters would change i remember one commercial we were an old couple uh, talking about Bobby Knight. Well, well no, we, I, I forget. Weekend radio from we, Cleveland. We, yeah, we were talking about alien invasion or something like that. And <laughs> since we were both from Bloomington, Indiana, and Bobby Knight was an incredible, huge basketball coach hero of the town, at one point, my character said, get me Bobby Knight to fight off the aliens because Bobby Knight could win any battle. But this is the way Ellen tells stories from the inside out. So don't worry about that. Um, we, <laughs> we, I we, don't we, expect to be understood. Right, right. But we, we, we did those. And then we, when we moved Likewise. To, to Seattle, Ellen immediately got a job in, a, in a, a show out there that then toured. And they hired me once again to play guitar and banjo in the orchestra. And so we were on another tour, uh, this time in the United States. But uh, we started laughing about it after a while. We would get in shows together, but we would never talk to each other on stage. We would never even see each other on stage. Um, When we actually did a tour of Death of a Salesman, which has to be the talkiest play ever, and her character and my character said two lines to each other at the very last scene in the play. So it, it became kind of a joke that we never, act, we worked together a lot, but we never actually worked together. Um, but then in, um, in mid nineties, I started getting auditions for video games because video games were starting to be produced and uh, companies like Sierra Online and Humongous and Monolith were up in Seattle at that time. And I, 
but she convinced me to get a voice demo because I could get could make money that way. And so I did, and I got an agent and started doing that stuff. But when I tried to convince her to get a voice demo so that yeah. she could make money for us too. I was too busy. Well, and she said, Oh, well, they would never hire me. They, you know, that work is just for men. I have the wrong kind of voice and the I'll never work and stuff like that. And then and it the took like eight years of haranguing and pleading and whatever before she finally got a voice demo. And uh, and then of course she immediately became like a thousand times more famous than I was. So well, one of the most iconic voices in gaming. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll ever. finally do it fine since you're being so pushy. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly it. It's exactly it. Wow. <laughs> And then, you know, and then we start, I mean, the first, uh, the first video game we worked on together was Team Fortress 2, but of course this is voice acting. So you know, we, never, we never actually worked together. They and Valve didn't even know we were married. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. We, yeah. John they'd Fries. call me in for a session, then they'd call her in for a session. And then it wasn't until Team Fortress 2 that they just no, happened. No, not, not Team Fortress 2. Half-Life 2, yeah. I wanted to correct yeah, you, John. It was Half-Life 2. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, Half Life uh, Two was the first yeah. the first game we did together. Oh, right. But it wasn't until oh, Team right. Fortress Two that they actually called us in at, in successive sessions, where Ellen yeah. went in at two uh, and I came in at four or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Ellen Ellen came in and said, "Oh, you're going to be working with my husband later today." And they went, "What? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're married? What?" Right. And so they thought that was so funny. That's when they decided to cast us as the bickering married couple on the houseboat radio in yeah. Left 4 Dead. Yeah. So mm. so that's how they found out. Like Ellen was like, oh, you're going to work with my husband today. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's interesting. Hilarious. So uh, I'm going to dive into the Left 4 Dead questions since we're at topic. So Ellen did told us last time when she was on that you guys did that uh, couple together, but uh, actually uh, Ellen's voice is not heard during the game. Do you know anything about it, John? Right. I mean, they had us in and recording together and evidently at some point they decided that that was too, too distracting or didn't serve the game the way they thought it would. And so they just uh, edited out and had my voice on it because that was, I mean, basically what but I got paid. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, like so you many games paid, in exactly. this industry. Um, yeah. I mean, the original scene was that, you know, I was saying, hey, we have a houseboat here. We can take you out. And and she was in the background going, no, 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 there's zombies every place. You, you know, basically, it's just a, a bickering, nagging, nagging housewife saying that, you know, I should leave everybody to die and we should get out of there. Uh, and and I, it was really funny while we were doing it. But, yeah. you know, I mean, the way movies are made and the way video games are made and, and anything that you record and then edit, there's this process and it has to fit mm -hmm. in with the whole entire structure of the game. And yeah. at some point they decided, no, it's better for me to just do that mm -hmm. and not have the bickering housewife behind me. So was I that did. like, I was about to say, was that like by far like the funnest thing you guys did together is when the, like as far as well, working for Valve? It was very rare in that, we were both in the studio at the same time because mm -hmm. they wanted us to improv and improv this fight and, and stuff like that. Mm, um, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fun because usually you're just in there by yourself, yeah. but uh, I mean, it was fun and it, it, it was, it was great, great fun. Um, mm -hmm. But working with Val guys, I think that Ellen will agree is always fun. They're hilarious <laughs> maniacs. And yeah. so we always have a good time. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. I guess you enjoyed the role then, John. Oh, well, of the, of the houseboat radio? Yep. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, you know, working for, for video games, the only times where you're really not having fun is when the writing isn't all that good. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've been in video games where I'm not credited, where all I'm doing is saying, you know, left, right, health, uh, injury, <laughs> you know, medic, whatever, you know, the, where where the, the video game is just very simple and they don't really have any writing, but they wanted vocal yeah. prompts for the player. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now you had some of that. You had some of that in Half-Life 2 because, you know, you played as the rebel and like you would be like either a rebel or a medic and you would say, here, take this med kit. Can you actually say that real quick? Here, take this med kit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fun because you're actually acting, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, and, mm. and even if that's all you're doing, they're they're telling you listen you're in the middle of a battle and you have to shout or yeah. you're sneaking around you have to be quiet and stuff like that so that's still 
that's that's great fun because you're you're helping to construct this imaginary scene that that uh, that other people get to actually place themselves in, and that's why I enjoy. I enjoy yeah. uh, playing video games because I was always a big a big fan of animation, even when I was a little kid, because here was something that I was watching that didn't exist, that artists mm. had made up. And to actually be able to go into the place and open doors and interact with things in the pictures and stuff was just so cool for me. And I, it remains cool for me to this day. Mm. Have you ever played Half-Life 2 or Team Fortress 2? I have played Half-Life 2 extensively, and I've played uh, Portal um, through to the end. I never managed to beat Portal 2, um, and I played Team Fortress 2 just a little bit, but boy, it was so fast, I just couldn't keep up with it. So, uh, and, and my Steam name is John Patrick Lowry, so I was too embarrassed to actually be in the game and have everybody totally slaughter me in the game that I was <laughs> uh, one of the voices in. So mm. Go, going back to what you were saying about interactivity and being immersed in the game and all that, uh, have you in recent times uh, tried v virtual reality or anything relating to that? Well, we, we got to, uh, since we're, you know, we do the international for valve, they, they, you know, said, Hey, come on over and, and uh, try our, our VR helmet. Um, I don't have one because we don't have a room big enough where I can walk around in to do that. I mean, this is the biggest room we have and you can see it's pretty crowded with stuff. Um, I would love it. I, I loved it when I did. I got to, to walk around on Mars at Valve and uh, interesting, one of the, one of the uh, little demos they had was on the top of a mountain in the, in the uh, Washington State Cascades that I had climbed. So I'd been there. And so I got to yeah. virtually stand on a mountain that I had actually climbed to the top of. So that was fun. And uh, there's actually a, a virtual reality uh, storefront in a in a, a area of town near us in Ballard, right. and it's called Portal. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I I went there and I tried it out, and and what I did uh, was I guess sort of like Google Earth. And yeah. uh, I had to sit on a stool because it made me dizzy. <laughs> so I, you know, I walked around a little bit, but then I had a stool right there with my hand on it. And it was very <laughs> interesting. And I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. So I went to Nashville and walked around Nashville virtually, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> But but it was also kind of disconcerting. So, um, you know, I haven't done it again. But if you've ever been to Nashville, Nashville itself is kind of disconcerting. So it's, <laughs> it's hard to say if it was the VR or not. So it fits for VR. <laughs> I've been to, uh, I've been, I've been to uh, Gatlinburg. Yeah. Gatlinburg. Yes. So have we. I've been there. Yeah, I've been to that one. Yeah, place. well, Gatlin, Gatlinburg nice. is, you know, in the Smoky Mountains, and yeah. um, it's, uh, you know, it used to be when I was a little girl, we'd go there, and it was really a tiny place. You know, now it's a, a big industry, dare, dare I say, tourist trap. <laughs> right, right. It's just a town that is engineered to relieve uh, people of extra money before they go hiking in the mountains. Uh, I but grew up in Colorado. Pretty. You know, it's yeah, pretty. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Colorado, and uh, Tennessee has Smoky Mountain National Park, and Colorado has Rocky Mountain National Park, and Estes Park is the little town outside of Rocky Mountain National Park that's basically just like Gatlinburg with all the miniature golf courses and silly things that you can do before you go into the park. Yeah, I did climb up one of the mountains. It was a fun time though. It was it was the oh, most the smokies are yeah it's a yeah, beautiful park. it was yes. it was beautiful. Yeah we we spent a whole day just climbing up that mountain and just uh -huh. getting to the top. And when we went to the top it was such a liberating experience. Like I this it, this was the closest like in like to God in this body, you know? <laughs> right, right. No, that, I mean, that's why I love climbing mountains. Uh, me and my climbing buddy, Andy, we, we called it getting dinky, you know, that you would get really? to a place where you would realize how huge the universe was and how small you were. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's the, the experience that you're talking about is that you're, you feel close to the creation. You're seeing so much of it and you're such a tiny, tiny, tiny part of it. Exactly. Um, you get, you get a better, 
a better perspective on uh, your place in the world. And, well, uh, many religions associate mountaintops with the divine. Oh, yeah. And mm. in, in stories of different religions, this is always where humanity meets the divine. So yeah, many times. It's, um, um, I think there's something to that. Maybe. Absolutely, yeah. Got the gist of what you said about, like, you know, the, you know, the Gatlinburg area. But um, right, right, yeah, yeah. Gatlinburg to to reiterate, uh, you know, we've been there, and Gatlinburg is very much like Estes Park in Colorado, and they, yeah. they both appeal to tourists on their way to the park, and they appeal to families, and they have lots of places for families to spend money when they are on their way to climbing mountains. Yeah, and you know, I I I heard uh, Ella, you said that there's a place called Port. Like it's a, is it a restaurant? No, it's it's a virtual it's a, reality store. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We so have, we have rooms and booths. So it, it's in Ballard, you know, here right. in Seattle. Yeah. And uh, it, it's called Portal, and you yeah. go in and you rent a, a virtual reality machine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. <laughs> in in uh, like 15 minute increments you know 15 mm. minutes half yeah hour, hour, a storefront whatever. right, right. It, is glados yeah. is the announcer of it <laughs> no probably she not i don't be. think so <laughs> but she i did want to mention not. i i yeah. actually wanted to like you know put out there a quick tidbit of something i experienced in my life that was quite peculiar i had there's this restaurant in my area right and it's a video game themed restaurant and like there's a burger called the GLaDOS. <laughs> and, and, nice. and how is that prepared? With it fish? was good. It had like, <laughs> no. Does it, it have deadly neurotoxin on it? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Like I'll probably die. <laughs> right, you know? right. to just spray like, it with every poison known to man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I really wanted to mention that because that reminded me like, you know, that there's, because there's this restaurant here that that serves a burger called the glados burger and there's also like a half-life theme it's called the black mesa it's like oh, a uh -huh. it's like a chicken chipotle wrap or something i don't know but it's like i, I remember <laughs> like it had like blue cheese on it and stuff you know it was pretty good but i just wanted to let you know ellen i did have a burger called the glados and um and and, you and where where is that where where yeah where is it i just go there now uh, it is in Savannah, Georgia. It's it's a Savannah, restaurant Georgia. called. Yeah, I, yeah. I live in Savannah, and uh -huh. that's that's where we go to sometimes. It's called. Oh my God! What is it called? I'm so sorry. I forgot the name of it. It's called um, the Chromatic Dragon. Check that place out. <laughs> if you guys are paying us for the area, free advertisement. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, they they also they had one. Yeah, they had one in my in my small town, but but uh, they have it like in. I live right next to Savannah, so they had one in my 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 general area, like right by my house. But then I they kind of like they went, but now, but they're in a they're in Savannah, Georgia now. So, um, oh man, we, Ellen and I have actually played in Savannah. We we performed there once. Oh, yeah. Wow, on the on the second tour that we did together, when I was still playing in the in the orchestra, we were in Savannah. That was probably a while ago then, huh? Back oh, yeah. in uh, 80, 89, no, 90. 90, 90, 90, 90, fall of 90, 90. right. Mm. Fall of 90. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, but uh, Ellen's sister still lives, she lives in South Carolina, so we might get down to Savannah sometimes to try a Gladys cool. burger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> if, we, yeah, if I mean, we are, we'll give you a call and, and meet you there, and we can all enjoy a Gladys burger. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, that would be cool, yeah. I mean, just let me know, and I could, you know, be your be your guide. The thing is, I didn't exist. You said 1990, right? Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't exist then, so now <laughs> I do. Did I. But even yeah. though, when I was in Savannah, people were talking about you, so, you know. Yeah, were, uh... maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say I, uh, I hear some whispers on the streets sometimes but, yeah 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 i understand that i understand that but you know yeah i mean i exist now so if you want to you know come back to savannah and uh you know we could try the glados burger and we could and that. the great chip yeah, be great. yeah just just let you me know, know i i learned something recently i was listening to a trivia uh right test and the question was what is the biggest state east of the mississippi 
Well, I was going to guess, you know, Pennsylvania, yeah. but it's Georgia. It's not Florida? No, it's <laughs> Georgia. Georgia by square miles. <laughs> right, right. Georgia mm. is the biggest state east of the Mississippi River. That's which interesting. I didn't know. And it's interesting. The biggest state east of Connecticut and south of Massachusetts is Rhode Island. <laughs> That's kind of geography hard jokes. Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, that can't be right. I think you're. <laughs> I think you're pulling my leg out right now. Uh, oh my yeah. goodness. Real quick, uh, Flash, did you want to ask some Dota questions just because you love that game like more than yes, anyone else? Uh, then... Well, you know, 4,000 hours probably count for Ooh. something, rather. <laughs> Get a medal. Uh, right. Well, all right. Dota segment. <clears throat> uh, He's prepared first... a long time for this. Okay. Yes. yes I, I... <laughs> Sleepless nights go by where I think, oh, what, what will I ask them this time? Yeah. <laughs> well... <laughs> Right. So in relation to Dota, uh, right. First question is more, like I tried to word these so they're just so they can be answered by either of you, uh, whoever, whoever wants to go first. Okay. Um, so how exactly did your involvement in Dota first start about? Like, was it just as simple as because you were already in cahoots with Valve, you were just moved around their projects or was oh, it something a bit audition. more interesting? We had we were we were sent auditions by our agent Valve asked. Uh, our agent to, you know, send out these character descriptions and lines and our agent sent them out and we all auditioned. Yeah, I mean, Valve auditioned all over the world for the voices for the heroes. Um, but they did know our voices because we had worked with them before and certainly, you know, and Ellen was mega famous for, for Portal and I was doing pretty well for Sniper. Um, mm -hmm. So I suppose we were on the short list, but we did audition and uh, the first they, they sent us out basically since there's so many heroes in in dota i think it's up to what 120 now or something 120 like that? something they keep adding one every year right right um but they would send us out packets of like eight characters to audition for and then they'd pick us for some and they'd pick me for four uh that first time through i think it was uh, some or none well, right. Some and some we wouldn't get, you know, um, because there were so many, and you know, and, and actors from all over the world got them. But uh, uh, I think the first four that I got were um, Pudge, uh, uh, Earthshaker, Doom, and um, and uh, uh, Storm Spirit. Oh. And the interesting thing about that was that. I got the job just because they liked, I think, Pudge. And so they brought me in and they just had me do these three other characters. But at, on the date that I went in, I had a cold. And so I had the deep register of my voice and I had the high register of my voice, but I didn't have the middle. And so for, fortunately, Pudge is down here and he talks rock bass. And do Ms. Evil and the Devil and all this kind of stuff. And Earthshaker is also very deep. And then they wanted a fourth voice, but they didn't want it deep. And so I came up with Storm Spirit, who is up here. Storm Spirit is a you know professional thespian, and he always talks up here in this part of his voice, because that was the only part of my voice that I had left. So that's how <laughs> Storm Spirit came in to be. Mm. And what about Ellen? I'm sorry? What about Ellen? Um, I yeah, think she has um, two roles there. Yeah. I, I auditioned for so many of those um, female heroes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill Van Buren, who is a friend, and I didn't get any of them. Didn't get any of them. And I, I happened to see Bill Van Buren at, at another occasion and I, you know, I made some crack about, well, you're not going to use me for anything, you know, for Dota. And Bill Van Buren said, we're saving you for something more poisonous. Uh. Those were his words. Uh. So, of course, what I've done is brood mother. You know, the we're saving you for a giant horrifying, horrifying spider. <laughs> yeah. So, so they saved me for something more poisonous. But I've only done two. John's yep. done seven. Actually, eight now. Oh. Eight. Oh. Eight. Oh. Eight. Oh. eight. I My have goodness. done two. 
Wait. But that's all maybe right. Maybe more to come. I'm not well, bitter. I mean, wait, when you mean eight, you mean Voice of the International, right? In addition to all the heroes, or which no, is the eighth one? No, the eighth one was more, and of course, I don't know. They bring me in, and who knows if they ultimately use it. But uh, yeah. is somebody called the Pilgrim or something like that? Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, <laughs> well, this is new information. Okay, that's fun. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was seven for a long time, and then they had they was one of the newer characters they developed. And they had me in for one more voice. So, uh, That's Flash, very interesting. Flash, but. who's the Pilgrim? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, the I thing don't is know. that's actually not a name. Um, right, I don't remember really. They had me. Yeah. This was uh, like it, it, it could pro possibly be a cut content, but the thing is that Valve, the way they work, is they occasionally because they're very nice people, they love to leave old information in their updates. So if you go data mining in their games, you get to find um, strings for heroes and all that. The closest I can get to that is an unreleased hero called the Puppet Master, uh, which mm. is a, which was a thing in the files. That so I don't know if that be... rings any bells, but yeah, Pilgrim. Yeah, that that, that might have been it. Puppet Master might have been yeah, it. Could, that's mm. actually very interesting, huh? That, that's Vo Vox Scoop. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Vox uh, Scoop. Ellen. Are you? Ellen, yeah. do you still remember the voices you used for those Dota characters? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Dead prophet, follow your fate. And ugh, what is that? Magic. Ugh, rude mother's heart. Yeah, she's a lot you more. Need, you need some after effects with that one, right? Mother knows best. Oh. She has a lateral wrist. And she loves her little spiderlings. Well, I love the story behind the, the voice of, of Death Prophet, too. Well, Death Prophet. I did the audition for Death Prophet, and I did, I did sort of an Eastern European thing. Hmm. You know, not dreadfully accurately, but that was, you know, sort of my take. Kind of a um, Hungarian Zsa Zsa Gabor kind yeah. of. Uh, so I'm actually I next to Hungarian. And they said, I'm oh, Hungary. somebody else has used this accent. Can you do something else? Can you do French? And I right. said, okay. But I had, you know, had this other sound in my head. So then I sort of had to travel across Europe into France so John and I just think of Death Prophet as Euro trash. Right. She just has a generally European accent. Yeah, oh. it's, who, know, who it's knows? Somewhere in that region, from. you know, we can't really bring up specifics, but right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Because oh. I always thought that the inspiration behind her was like Dracula, sort of like vague. I, it's like sort of the same way. I, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's another character that vaguely sounds like Euro Trash as well, and that's Lycan. And he's supposed to also be inspired a lot by that sort of region. So I thought uh -huh. that was it. But hmm, the, the the French thing makes sense as well. <laughs> <laughs> there may be. There may be a tiny little smattering of a French accent in Death Maybe. Prophet, <laughs> right, but, right. but I don't know. I she never quite made it to France. I don't. Mm. I don't guarantee her nationality. Mm. I it's, see. it's ambiguous. You don't want to reveal it. Her mother was Hungarian. Her father was a traveling man. Yeah. What can you say? <laughs> I, I, I wonder if they'll do anything more with her, um, no, knowing what Val Valve have announced in recent times. Uh, speaking of, my, might as well rip the bandaid off of that one. Uh, you know, recently that Valve announced the Dota Netflix anime show. Are you, well, are you familiar heard, with that? We have heard about that from fans. What but, is ah. that? Uh, well, apparently Valve decided to expand upon the Dota universe by adapting it uh, to a Netflix show. Right, and uh, if, if they do that, that's great. And if they call us in to take part in that, then we will do it. Um, okay, Let's well, that hope. was the question, and there's the answer. Let's hope. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, I mean, it, evidently it's in fairly early stages of planning, uh, or maybe it's completely done and they all did it in Europe, or, I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, uh, with these... Uh, <laughs> Kind of things i was uh i auditioned for 11 months i think i i auditioned seven times for a lord of the rings game before it ever got made and i ended up being different characters than i auditioned for and particularly nowadays when you know every corporation has access to voice talent all over the world they can uh you know sometimes it's a very involved process so yeah if they if they uh if they want us in it they'll let us know mm. fair enough 
Yeah. Yep. It's um, exciting though, isn't it? A Netflix Dota. Yeah. Yeah. That'd like, be oh, that'd oh, be yeah. fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's extremely exciting whenever Valve decides to take one of their dusty ten-year-old, decade-old IPs yeah. and actually do something with it. I know, <laughs> I know. Now you sound not, not holding any resentment over anything. Not, well, not like the first Half-Life game happened uh, a year ago, and it was a decade before the, the one before that. Let's not get right. into that subject. Let's not get into that. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, There's a lot uh, of people who are bitter, but, you know. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, so, since we already broached the subject before, uh, this was the last question, but I'm pushing it up now. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned that there were roles that you auditioned for for Dota in particular that you know, that never really made the cut. Uh, can you share some of those for trivia? I wouldn't sake? remember. I mean, I they, you know, they send out bunches of characters and oh. we audition, we got the ones we got. Mm. So, yeah, uh, I see. Maybe a lot of uh, concepts. That was, too. that was a long time ago. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at least a decade ago. So understandable. Right. Right. <laughs> well, oh, close to a decade. <laughs> 20, yeah. 2013, I think. Well, that's Maybe. when the game was released. So I don't know when the voiceovers happened. It's crazy. Uh, All right. I, so I have this question. It's a. Uh, it's interesting. So are you guys aware of this website, 15AI? That is basically a website that can replicate your voices. No, that, no. okay. So this is going to get into apocalyptic Black <laughs> Mirror territory. This is kind of really kind of crazy because yeah. you know how technology is evolving more. Right. And like, you know, people can like basically synthesize voices like mm -hmm. like Ella, like you know like you did like an airplane like you like you were a voice for the 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 guidance system for the for the mm -hmm. honeywell airports airport yes. right? right yeah so like <laughs> i mean people are just making voices out of out of thin air they can generate now. voice lines for example from glados or the sniper yeah i just heard about this yesterday actually mm -hmm. um wow wow yeah because uh a person, so I have this uh, company, Oral Vision, that produces full cast audio dramas. I, I'm the voice of Sherlock Holmes, and we do these. HarryNile.com. Yeah, HarryNile.com <laughs> is our webpage. Um, and uh, a, a young woman uh, from uh, Pennsylvania State uh, uh, wrote to us about doing an internship with us. And, uh, and we, we just talked on uh, Saturday, and um and, and just about you know how how that would work and what her project would be and stuff like that and she told me that she took one of our shows uh an episode of murder in the murdochs uh called have i told you lately that i that i loathe you um and she uh rewrote the script a little bit because she thought that the pattern between the two main characters maxine and piper murdoch who are two women sounded a lot to her like the spy and the scout and so she rewrote the script so that both of those characters who are female in our show become male as the spy and the scout and then she went to what is ai 15 is that the name of it yeah 15 ai right. yeah 15 ai oh, so, yeah. something along and, those lines and had the spy and the scout be the two main characters and then one of the characters was the sniper and one of the characters was the heavy, and it was all uh, 15 AI uh, generated mm. voices based on the voices of the actors. So yeah, I did mm. hear that. And it was, and it, you know, I mean, it's like the technology still has a long way to go before you really yeah. believe that these are just human beings. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I was yeah. impressed by, by how much they could do. Yeah, I mean, up to this point, I mean, like you said, they it's not you know com completely 100 percent because like the the you know you put the the voice lines in the technology and like it it it's just some source material it's not a lot like it, it doesn't sound right. natural a lot. yeah yeah right not completely well, and you certainly don't get the delivery that you get from yep. an actual person who's analyzed the scene and stuff like that yeah yes yeah, yeah. so you can't really give any directions to uh right to an ai right right and it's very finicky and monotone so it, it still has a lot of growing pains to go through before you're all out of a job <laughs> right right but i but i do think that as a fan source for people wanting to put together mods and stuff like that yeah that it, uh, that it could be fun for fans to to use the voices of the characters they like yeah definitely exactly yeah well, there's also there's all, there always seems to be this general consensus of a dream for people to like make Glados a like a GPS system in their Garmin, you know, 
And like, right. I, I, it, I'm, I'm looking at this like objectively, like I'm looking at this website that could do this. I'm like, this is more possible. Like Ellen, what do you think about your voice probably becoming a GPS, like under like, you know, like a website being able to generate lines, you know, like, you know, just what, what do you, what are your guys' thoughts of well, I mean, now, we're, now we're really getting into the legal challenges for intellectual property these days. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, being creators of content, uh, you know, digital is both, you know, the hugest blessing in the world mm -hmm. and the hugest curse. Um, on the one hand, I remember I worked with tape. I worked back when everything was analog and every time you re-recorded something, you added a level of noise. Mm -hmm. So really you, you know, you could do it once, twice, maybe, but by the third time it was unusable because there was so much noise. And now with digital, you can record it an infinite number of times and there's no increase in noise, but it also means that Chinese, you know, corporations can pirate stuff forever. And yeah. unless, unless, you know, we, we come up with, I mean, you know, you, you have these strange. I don't know why you said Chinese corporations, but anybody could pirate stuff. Well, right. But, but the Chinese have been particularly notorious about, about doing that. Um, uh, the, the, uh, but, you, you, but also just regular old people, people would come into movie theaters yeah. with their cell phones and make a recording of the movie and put it up on the web. And so you'd get these weird commercials in front of movies just asking people not to do that because ultimately if we don't get paid, we can't do this. You know, video games cost millions of dollars to make movies cost millions of dollars to make. Yeah. And if people are just stealing them, but it was interesting at valve, they realized they would, you know, work for more than a year on something like half-life two. And the day after it was released over half of the copies out there were pirated copies. And so they stopped releasing video games. They started instead doing things like Dota. Dota was free to play from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. There never was a release date for Dota. It was always just free to play. And then they started introducing stuff to the games that people would pay for to make the games better. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are still video game uh, companies selling games and stuff like that. And so I think of uh, the, the original... I mean, there was always going to be a surge of, oh my God, we can we can record this digitally and it's almost as good as the original. Um, and so people would just do this, but ultimately if everybody did that, no video games would ever get made. And so, I mean, I see on Steam now, there are lots of new video games coming out and they're being sold and stuff like that. So I think we've kind of gotten to an equilibrium again. And like we say, there's one yeah. thing about assembling a part made of GLaDOS voiced words by Ellen McLean, there is a completely other level of actually getting Ellen McLean to act for you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I, I, that is still, you know, I think centuries off when they, mm -hmm. you know, to actually get an artificial intelligence that can somehow duplicate emotional content and the ability to analyze dialogue and and come up with surprising performances because that's one of the things about GLaDOS that was so wonderful is that she took you by surprise all the time saying these horrible things in such a nice way or nice things in such a horrible way um and and that comes out of a human intellect and to get a, an artificial intelligence I mean one of the things that, that I find funny that nobody else is thinking about is that whenever people talk about artificial intelligence, they're always talking about electronics. And people, I mean, no one seems to have realized <laughs> that when we talk about self-awareness, what is the self that we are aware of? We have this electronic gadget in our heads that is aware of chemistry. It's aware of our blood chemistry, so we're hungry. It's aware of our skin chemistry, so we're cold. It's aware of all kinds of things, our, our hormones because that, that make us lonely. And all of that is chemical. And unless you de develop a computer that is attached to a biological thing that gets hungry, that gets lonely, that gets angry, you know, then it's not going to have any, you know, if, if we were just a brain with no body, the brain would 
you know, we could feed the brain blood, but the brain wouldn't be getting any data from the body to know how it felt about anything. Uh, and so, and, and at this point, all AIs are that. I mean, they can attach them to cameras, they can attach them to microphones so that they can see and hear, but they don't have a biological existence that that brain is aware of that, so that the computer can say, you know, I want a hamburger, or, you know, I want to play this blues lick, or I want to scream, or anything like that. I mean, once somebody once asked me, do you think a computer will ever write a symphony? And I responded, that depends on whether a computer ever wants to write a symphony. And to have, to develop a computer that has desires, actual desires, not programmed desires, then you're not going to get that, that biological sound that mm -hmm. actors have because what actors bring is the experience of a lifetime of being hungry and lonely and cold and hot and excited and bored and everything else that human beings get. You know, computers don't start running low on blood sugar. If you turn the electricity off, they just shut down. You know, yeah. they either have enough electricity or they don't. It's all, it's all, uh, it's all digital. It's all, you know, binary. So, so, I mean, I, I've been, uh, I also sing with a professional choir up here that does soundtracks for video games and soundtracks for movies and stuff like that. And there was a time where we would go to a gig and just sing vowels on different pitches. And we knew that those were going to go into MIDI, MIDI sequencers and stuff like that so that people could write music. But if you want the sound of a choir and you want the sound of an orchestra and you have the money, you hire a choir and an orchestra. And if you don't have the money, you have something that sounds pretty nice, but it's not mm -hmm. the same as a choir and an orchestra. So it's going to be a while. I, yeah. yeah, that's such a good point. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's really something I've, I've been thinking about. And I think a lot of other people have been thinking about too. It's like, you know, the more technology comes out like that, like what, what is really possible, you know, like it's right. And ultimately I think it comes down to why we can't tickle ourselves. Um, <laughs> you know, something that we create can't take us by surprise because mm -hmm. we created it. And, um, but other human beings are, you know, each human brain has as many neural pathways as there are stars in the galaxy. They are going to come at us with a unique perspective on the universe and take us by surprise all the time. Yeah. And that's what makes us fall in love. That's what makes us get excited. That's what makes us laugh. Um, it's what makes us cry. Uh, and that's what we're after, I think, in video games and in movies and in, in any kind of musical performance that, that, that takes us by surprise and takes us to a place where we weren't expecting to go and realize that we share that experience with another human being. Do you guys well, have, I mean, I mean, I found this really interesting. It's well, a, well, us too. I mean, we're, we're yeah, in the industry I mean, and it does I mean, affect it's, us. It's maybe when we could attach a computer to a biological body, <laughs> then maybe yes, um, it could create some GLaDOS lines. Sam, right. I mean, if, are if you Ellen attached dies, to a computer? If Ellen dies and somebody decides to attach a computer to her and bring her back to life, Ooh. then that would be the perfect GLaDOS. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, this has been lots of fun. Thanks so much for having us. Contract completed. Now, you may subscribe and like the video, you poor fool. Overtime. <laughs>